This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Check out our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, at youtube.com slash UCTV Prime. Subscribe today to get new programs every week. The emphasis today will be, this, in this hour, will be on the measurement and how you can infer from the measurements what the CO2 composition of your solution is. So one relevant quotation perhaps to remember when you think about what equipment you should be buying to do CO2 measurements. Undoubtedly, it's unwise to pay too much, but it's worse to pay too little. Because if it doesn't work for what you need, you wasted all your money. Whereas if you spent a little too much, yeah, you still got what you needed. And so talking about CO2 measurements, I just want to bring into your mind the ideas first made famous by Daniel Golden of NASA, the idea that you could think about engineering things to be at once faster and better and cheaper. Of course, the popular consensus on this was that it was self-evident to just pick two of these, <laughs> that you couldn't have it faster, better, and cheaper, but perhaps faster and cheaper, or better and cheaper, but nonetheless. The question you should probably ask yourself is, is this necessarily true for carbonate system measurements in seawater? And again, as you think about measurements in seawater, the ideas of faster, you understand, more measurements per hour per minute per second, depending upon what rate you're doing this. Cheaper, uh, typically people forget all the costs that go into making a, a measurement, but they are capable of quantification. So part of the discussion is going to be how do we define better? What makes it a better measurement? Well, before I get to that, let me just iterate that of course, nobody wants to say I make low quality measurements. <laughs> <laughs> On the other hand, realistically, quality means the measurement is appropriate for what you want to use it for, not that it's the best that could ever be made. And it's important to bear that in mind, that you first have to think, how well do I want to measure something? And if you achieve that, you have a high quality measurement. If you don't achieve that, it doesn't matter how much money and time you spent on it. So the fitness for purpose is that the property of the data that enables you to make the technically correct decision for a stated purpose. So I want to know the carbonate ion concentration within 1%. I would suggest relaxing that criterion. It's hard to do, as I'll show you. But let's say uh, you only want it within 15%. Well, it's probably pointless to pay the extra $200,000 to get it within 1% if 15% was going to be adequate. So think about how well you need to know the results that you're actually getting from this. And essentially, this fitness refers to the magnitude of the uncertainty associated with the measurement in relationship to your needs. High quality, it fits your needs. Low quality, it doesn't. Of course, this does have implications for typically how much it costs. Because on the whole, making measurements with a lower uncertainty takes more trouble 
and more trouble usually means more time, and more time usually means more money. So when assessing better, uncertainty, of course, isn't the only measure. You want to consider how well you require the uncertainty. You're not just looking for a lower and lower uncertainty. Adequate is all you really need. You need to think how much does it actually cost to make a measurement. This is the easy number to remember because you go to your advisor as a graduate student and say, I'd, I'd like to buy one of these. And they go, what, 80,000? No, can't possibly do this. You know, so-and-so has a gadget in his lab. Can't you use that? <laughs> if you know what the overall uncertainty you require is, that's an easy discussion. Yes, I could use that. No, it won't work. But despite the heart intact inducing effects of asking for a large amount of money up front to buy equipment, that's not really where the money goes when you make chemical measurements. Sadly, this is one of the big expenses. How much does it really cost to train somebody to use that equipment? Because let's say, oh, Pauline will show you how to do it. Fine. But Pauline's paid, I don't know, 20, 30 cents an hour every day. <laughs> it costs a certain amount for that person to train you. Your time is typically money as well. There's, if it takes six months to train somebody to make a measurement, that's a very, very big expense that often, if you do this for two or three graduate students a year, easily outweighs the cost of buying easier to use equipment in the first place. The cost of the analysis itself, the time and materials. The other part is, of course, the convenience of making a measurement. That's typically pretty important. One, if you own the equipment yourself, then the equipment's got to work, so it's got to be well maintained. On the other hand, if it's in somebody else's lab, maybe they're making sure it's maintained. Perhaps not. Your risk. How big a sample does it get? Need. If you take things, says no problem, we can get a really good measurement. We need one liter of sample, and you go, but I only do 200 mil samples, and that's got to keep the organism for another few days. I'd like to take half a milliliter out. Then clearly there's a mismatch there. And you have to design your equipment to match the sample size or design your experiment so it can provide samples of the size that your equipment needs. The two tie together. 3C is perhaps one of the most important parts in convenience of measurement. If you want highly accurate alkalinity and total carbon measurements, you can send bottles to my lab to get analyzed. On a good day, you might get a result within two weeks. On a bad day, that could be an awful lot longer. That's not always convenient for you in designing how the next part of your experiment goes. It's relatively cheap, not because you say, what, it's $100 a sample, but rather you go, whoa, I didn't have to spend $80,000 on equipment, $40,000 on training, and waste my time making the measurement. I just send it away, and for 100 bucks, here comes the answer. But that delay is often not convenient for you. So you want to have a system that gives you the measurements in a timely fashion. Here's another part that's often difficult to think about the cost of making a wrong measurement. If that really doesn't matter very much, that's one thing. If it matters a great deal, then that's something else. Because it comes down to how reliably you can make these measurements. If they're wrong, you'd start designing a different experiment, which was total waste of time, you have a problem. On the other hand, you maybe make multiple replicates and one wrong out of three, and you can tell which one it is, which is not always straightforward, then you're OK. So when assessing whether it's a better measurement, purely thinking about the uncertainty of the measurement is not the only measure. You want to know, does it cost what I can afford? Is it as convenient as I need? Does it give me results with the quality I need? Now, there's a book, The Guide to Best Practices for Ocean CO2 Measurements, that 
I helped edit, that gives in gory detail recipes for making all the CO2 measurements related to seawater. But, and it's a large but, these procedures are aimed at scientists who are making open ocean measurements. With an open ocean measurement, typically the reason it's being done is to look at the CO2 coming into the ocean from the atmosphere and quantifying how, how much that is changing interannually, or certainly over a 10-year period. So you need low uncertainties and We'll just go through that list of doing it because you'll see that this is not necessarily the way you're thinking. For open ocean measurements, overall uncertainty. Basically, the approach taken by the scientific community doing these measurements is they want the measurements as good as possible. And you go, OK, but <laughs> money no object. <laughs> The cost of making the measurements is realistically not a consideration for most open ocean CO2 measuring systems. Not because money really is no object, but because the amount of money you can pour into this and make it better hits an asymptote quite quick. <laughs> Convenience of measure. Well, it would be nice if it was convenient, but we'd rather have good measurements even if they're not convenient. So again, that overall uncertainty is driving this with this as good as possible approach to doing it. And cost of making a wrong measurement is perceived as high, which is reasonable. You're talking about a sample from the ocean that's very expensive to collect. The day of ship time is extremely expensive. The costs of having all the people on the ship able to make the analyses is extremely expensive. You really don't want wrong measurements. Is this really ocean acidification measurements as you know it? Probably not. I'd hesitate to say, I think for ocean acidification measurements, I don't think people have really thought about that. I haven't heard people say, oh yes, we have to have the carbonate to such and such a precision such and such an uncertainty because on the whole, you got what you got and say, yeah, that's bound to be OK. <laughs> it's not tip at this stage yet a really planned and thought through thing. Cost of measurements. I spelt it wrong there. Should be nice if they were cheap <laughs> because on the whole, doing the chemistry is seen as a sideline <laughs> and occasionally a rather expensive sideline. Please, let's have these be convenient measurements. And I think I'd venture to say that people haven't really thought through. So we're in a somewhat more nascent field here. We've not really thought through this. So although there's all those wonderfully thought out methods appropriate for the open ocean, to say you'll take those and use them wholesale for ocean acidification brings with it problems of cost and convenience. On the other hand, one of the conveniences is people have already thought, where do you buy the pieces? How do you train people to do this? And how do you make the measurements? So there are advantages. So any time you're thinking about an analytical method for your own purposes, these are the key questions you should think about. How does it work? If you don't know how it works, the chance you're ever going to make it work right is slim. Because the moment it goes wrong, you won't notice. How is it calibrated? All chemical measurements take an output on some machine, a number, on a meter, digital, whatever, and ratio it to that number on something where you thought you knew the answer. <laughs> this process is called calibrating the sample. So ask yourself clearly, how is a method calibrated? <laughs>
Because again, if you don't understand that, the chance of seeing where it goes wrong is small. What's the overall uncertainty of the measured value? This overall uncertainty is essentially a range of values which with a certain known confidence includes the right answer. This is not so straightforward to come up with because you didn't necessarily know what the right answer was. So otherwise, you wouldn't waste the time making the measurement, right? So getting this overall uncertainty is awkward, but there are strategies for doing it based on aggregating uncertainties from all the things that go into an experimental method. In a measurement for alkalinity, we've gone through this. There are about 10 sources of uncertainty, of which about five are roughly the same size and five can be ignored. <laughs> so it's the sum of all those uncertainties that gives you the overall uncertainty. And the overall uncertainty is always significantly bigger than the standard deviation. It's expressed as though it were a standard deviation, thus saying that you know with 67% pop probability plus or minus one of this would fit. But for instance, I can measure pH with a precision of about four ten thousandths of a pH unit. My estimate of the uncertainty for our measurements of pH is about 1,000, sorry, 0 0.015, so 150 ten thousandths of a pH unit. Almost 40 times as much. Could we improve that uncertainty? Yes, we're trying to. But have we succeeded yet? Not entirely. So it's not the same thing as saying, oh, I get a precise result. You can get things that are reproducibly wrong. <laughs> So precision alone is not an adequate picture. This is really a key question when you're thinking about a method. Does it provide the quality I need? If I get that overall uncertainty, is that what I needed for my scientific purposes? And of course, I've got this at the fifth and last thought. <laughs> and realistically, what does it cost to use? Because Really, if you can't afford to use it, then so be it. But something else has to give if it really is what you have to do to provide the quality you need. So with that picture in your mind, remembering all these pieces, I'm just going to go quickly through talking about the analytical parameters for the seawater CO2 system. And we mentioned them in the last lecture. Total dissolved inorganic carbon pH, pCO2, total alkalinity. Each of these can be measured. To have a complete description of the system, you really only need to measure two, if you're sure you're measuring them right. If you're careless enough to measure three, you will probably get some idea of how wrong you're measuring them, because the numbers won't agree. <laughs> And the reality is that's the way it works. They very rarely do agree perfectly. So let's just consider those four possibilities. Total carbon has real advantages. As I said, temperature and pressure independence. Take a sample, send it to San Diego. They make a measurement. It's still the total carbon in that seawater, provided it was stopped from changing by putting it in a closed bottle with something that killed everything that was growing in there, typically mercuric chloride. Problems? Well, you need care when sample handling, because if you just kind of pour it in the same way that pouring a soda from a height, you'll lose CO2. So it won't be the same total carbon by the time it ends up in your bottle as it was when you collected it. There aren't any systems that measure this automatically. You can't have an online system that's always just measuring the total carbon in your tank. Y you can kind of fudge one, but there, there isn't one that you could just go, oh, I'll buy that, and it'll give me the answers. pH, 
technical advantages, you can just put a sensor in your tank. Perhaps the best known one is the DuraFET, an ion selective field effect transistor system that works quite well. pH is a master variable. As I mentioned last time, the pH tells you the ratio of the acid and base forms of every acid base system in your solution. This is often important for considering how those things affect organisms, the speciation. So that's often thought of as a convenient thing. Problems, well, it's a function of temperature and pressure. We talked about that. If you lose CO2 or gain CO2, you change the pH. So again, to make those measurements, you have to be careful handling the sample. Interpretation problems. The problem with pH is you have to calibrate it. The problem with calibrating it is there are probably four different ways of calibrating it. Unless you know how you did it, interpreting what you did is next to impossible. So this is often the difficulty. Somebody says the pH was 7.7, .7, and you go, huh? That means it's a little bit more acidic than it might have been if you hadn't done anything to the seawater. But that kind of depends, because if it was really quite warm seawater, it could have been 7.7 .7 anyway without your doing anything to it. But if it was cold, that is kind of acidic. And then you go, well, is that 7.7 .7 on a total hydrogen ion concentration scale? The one I recommend, seal of approval, <laughs> or on one of the other scales, which are different to varying degrees. If you don't say, nobody knows. So that's kind of the difficulty with interpretation. For PCO2, biggest advantage, there are autonomous systems available. Any other advantage? Not really. Again, it's a function of temperature and pressure. So if you want to measure it, you really probably want to measure the PCO2 directly in your tank of seawater that something's growing in, which is not so straightforward, though it can be done. Changes are not easy to interpret. If the PCO2 changes, think back to that picture I showed of PCO2 versus carbonate ion concentration. Just changing the PCO2 doesn't tell you very much. You have to have at least two things. So you might say, well, I could measure pH and PCO2 autonomously. And the answer is yes, you could. But as we'll see later, that's not so desirable. Alkalinity, temperature and pressure independent, like total carbon. Changes in alkalinity can often be interpreted. If the alkalinity goes down in a system where things are calcifying, Maybe the change in alkalinity is telling you something about the extent of calcification, providing you weren't flowing seawater through it at the same time and you had to worry about doing the mass balance. So if it's in a closed system, changes are possible to interpret. It's awkward to measure autonomously. And if you've got other acid-base systems present that you don't explicitly acknowledge as being present, you can't interpret exactly what the alkalinity means. Though changes in the alkalinity probably are more meaningful, because if the pH hasn't changed that much and the alkalinity shifts, then you're saying, OK, that probably was something to do with the carbonate system, like calcification going on. But it's not so straightforward to interpret. So total dissolved inorganic carbon. This is really the way it's normally done. You take a sample of seawater and you acidify it. Add hydrochloric acid or phosphoric acid or sulfuric. Add a strong acid. What that does is it converts all the carbonate and bicarbonate to this form, unionized CO2. In a strong acid solution, these concentrations are, are still there, but they're very low. You can then extract the CO2 and measure it. The way people extract the CO2 and measure it depends upon the apparatus. 
One approach is referred to as coulometry. There's a, this is described in that handbook of methods I talked about. You purge your sample with a CO2 free gas. The CO2 is swept on, is absorbed by a proprietary jungle juice containing ethanolamine that becomes an acid when it reacts with the CO2, changes the pH of the solution. You measure coulometrically how much hydroxide you have to generate to get back to the original pH. That's proportional to the amount of CO2. A very reliable technique, pretty good precision, the order of a tenth of a percent, maybe a little bit worse than that, maybe a little bit better, depending upon who's bragging about it. Works day in, day out, kind of slow. On the other hand, you could simply say, well, I've got CO2 coming out. Couldn't I just integrate that amount of CO2, measure it with an infrared analyzer, as though it was a chromatographic peak? Yes, you can. And there are systems available that do it that way. There are other techniques, one quite elegant one, takes the CO2, it goes through a membrane into sodium hydroxide, and you measure the conductivity change in the sodium hydroxide. So those techniques exist. I'm really just going to talk about the infrared against colometry. For the infrared system, allows you to do more samples per hour. With the colometry system in my lab, for about 12 hours of work, we can run about 35 samples. With the infrared system, you could probably run with 12 hours of oh, 50 samples, 60 samples. There's less chemical waste to dispose of. Warm-up time, this is the bane of the coulometric method. Of that 12 hours, it's actually only making measurements for about nine of them. For three hours, it's you know being coddled and saying, go on, wake up, wake up, time to work. <laughs> Run it, is it stable? No, not yet. Maybe this valve is not properly tight. Maybe that tubing's not on properly. People messing around for a couple of hours to three hours to get it going. Then it works really well. The infrared system tends to start up somewhat quicker than that, still susceptible to problems. It can use smaller samples. This is good and bad. Typical size for coulometry is about 25 to 30 milliliters sample. Typical size for infrared is 2 to 5 milliliters. Loosely, the precision is proportional to the sample size. That is, you get better precision with a larger sample size. It's easier to measure out 25 mils within a tenth of a percent than it is to measure out one mil within a tenth of a percent. Or so those are the advantages. So colometry is more reproducible. The calibration is more stable. That is, we have essentially the same calibration for our system when it's working day after day after day, which is a good check on whether it's working or not. If it doesn't look like it's giving you the same calibration number, you go, well, what's wrong? And spend another hour fiddling with it. It's been well tested. The coulometry system is owned by probably about 50 different labs, maybe more, 60. And there's a lot of experience. In contrast, the infrared is less reproducible. The calibration is not so stable. That's not so big a problem. It just means you have to calibrate more frequently. We haven't really compared the results on, let's say, 10 different instruments from 10 different labs to see if they give you 10 plausibly different ver versions of the same number. We're planning an experiment next year where we'll send multiple labs the same sample to do that. On the other hand, the colometry is significantly slower, uses this somewhat hazardous proprietary colometer solution, the jungle juice to which I mentioned earlier, and significant warm-up. So, <coughs> At the moment, the colometry system works the best, but the infrared system has sufficient advantages to really justify thinking about taking it up. pH. We mentioned all this aspect. 
previously? Well, in essence, there are two approaches to pH. You can measure it with some form of electrode. With an electrode, the approach is very straightforward. What does the electrode read in a no solution of known pH? A pH standard or pH buffer compared to what does it read in the sample? The ratio of those two readings, or the difference between those two EMFs, those two voltages, is related to the difference in pH between your sample and your standard. So all you need is standards, and you're fine. Standards for seawater are not so straightforward, but they do exist. Another approach is spectrophotometric. Here, you put an acid-base system, an indicator dye, into your sample. As I said, the pH depends upon the ratio of the acid and base forms of the indicator dye. So with a spectrophotometer, you estimate what that ratio is. If you know the equilibrium constant for the dye, then you know what the pH is. In a perfect world, this gives you very good pH data. Sadly, we are not yet in a perfect world. So both of these sort of work, and both of them have some difficulties. pH cell, relatively cheap. This catches them every time. I buy a pH meter, 1,000 bucks. They might give it, throw it in free with a balance if I buy an expensive enough balance. Don't be fooled. That's not the cost of making pH measurements. It comes in all the other bits, <laughs> including cost of wrong measurement. The ease of use. It's fairly straightforward to use. You just put the probe in and read the number. But you really do need this recalibration. And with a glass electrode, the traditional pH sensor, that recalibration needs to be very frequent and carefully done. The people have experience with this CFET system, which is based on a, the Honeywell DuraFET. As I said, it's a particular ion selective field effect transistor sensor. And it seems to have a more stable calibration than a conventional pH cell. This would be the real convenience. But as yet, probably it's fair to say that there's only been a limited amount of work done with those looking at exactly how stable the calibration is and how reproducible it is. So if you measure the pH with a pH cell, the uncertainty you'll get at best is probably about O2. And you've got a problem because there's only a limited availability of suitable calibration buffers for checking this. My lab, we make up a tris buffer in a synthetic seawater. And I have one person working on this almost full time. And almost full time means purifying all the chemicals, making up 40 liters of buffer, calibrating it, and then starting again for the next batch. <laughs> and that's gradually growing as people want more and more of these buffers. And we'll see whether or not we can keep going at a useful rate on that. In contrast, our seawater calibration buffers we make about 600 liters at a time, so it goes further. <clears throat> the spectrophotometer, it's a different price. Again, you need temperature control, so that's built into that price when I have it. You can automate it. We have a system that's been partially automated. It can get a better precision, but the problem is this. You're assuming that you have a pure indicator dye. Unfortunately, there have been a couple of papers in the last few years pointing out that commercially available indicator dyes are not pure. Thus, chances are you do not have a pure indicator dye. Thus, you will not get a perfect pH measurement. If you have a pure indicator dye, then the uncertainty is less than 0.01. If you don't, it's probably <laughs> the same as with the electrodes, about 0.02. The thing to think about there is how much does that matter? An uncertainty of pH of 0.02 is about a 5% error 
in hydrogen ion concentration. So if you have a total carbon measurement, which is good to 0.2 of a percent, and a P hydrogen ion concentration, which is good to 5 percent, anything you ca calculate from it is mostly going to be affected by the pH, and it'll be good to 5 percent. The precision of the other didn't matter so much. Then the constants aren't so well, so call it 6 percent or 7 percent. Is that adequate for what you want? That comes back to the question, how well do you need the results? PCO2. You're measuring a particular species concentration. And we've talked here about how this is essentially usually in pressure units. Well, the approach that's taken is usually a gas phase equilibration. That is, we're going to equilibrate a gas phase with your water sample. Then we measure the concentration of CO2 in the gas phase, typically using a non-dispersive infrared analyzer. We're determining this number. We can measure the pressure. We get PCO2. Sometimes people measure how much CO2 there was in the gas phase with gas chromatography. There are benefits to that and awkwardnesses. Probably the infrared is the most commonly used approach. Now, you don't have to have a gas phase equi equilibration. You can actually put a membrane separating your solution from either a gas or a solution. In that case, if it's a gas, you just have an infrared analyzer there. There's a company that sells a device like this that looks potentially useful for ocean acidification purposes, apart from the price. It's about $25,000. Others say, OK, if we've got a liquid on the other side, when the CO2 comes through, it'll change the pH in that liquid. So if I have a pH meter in there, either an indicator die or a pH sensor, I can measure that change in pH. I can say that's due to the PCO2. This is the basis of the CO2 electrodes used in the medical uh, and a bunch of physiological work. It works reasonably well. Again, you've got the problem. If you can't measure pH that well, you can't measure PCO2 that well with this approach. So comparison techniques. The infrared analyzer systems fall in this kind of price range. <laughs> the quality depends largely on the design of the equilibrator. Because if you don't get that gas phase in equilibrium your water, all bets are off on how good the data are. It doesn't matter how good an infrared analyzer you have or how beautifully it's been calibrated. That equilibration is the important part. But with careful calibration and a good equilibrator, you can probably get better than half a percent on that. A really good measurement for $60,000. But it takes a lot of water. Because if you're going to have air that's in equilibrium with the water, but that did not change the composition of the water, you have to have a lot more water than you did have air. And so these are typically used with large amounts of water flowing by. And that's typically not the creature in a beaker discussion we heard earlier on this morning. There is one system that you can flow the water past it with a peristaltic pump. It has a membrane as the equilibration. So it's not such a good quality, but it works reasonably well. And that might work for ocean acidification because you can put the water back in the tank again <laughs> and therefore just measure the PCO2 directly with this sort of uh, flowing stream of water. And you know, we're going to buy one of those, and I'll let you know at some future meeting perhaps how well that works. pH-based analyzers tend to be cheaper. You can buy one from Sunburst Systems. The SAMI is this design. They're awkward to calibrate. Essentially, the SAMI is calibrated by however they calibrated it in Montana. And you kind of take that on trust. And at times, you wonder whether you should have taken it on trust. It's a membrane. So if bacteria grow on this membrane, which CO2 do you think you're measuring? The water coming by or a substantially modified version of it? This is the problem. If that membrane fouls, then it's no longer working as a good equilibrator. <laughs> 
because it's modifying. And, but it can be reasonably good precision, 1 to 2 percent. Total alkalinity. Essentially, the only way to measure alkalinity is to titrate it with acid, to ask how much acid it takes to titrate the bicarbonate and carbonate and borate and hydroxide to their zero level of protons, that is the CO2, boric acid, and water. And you can do this either in a closed cell, which means you don't lose CO2, or an open cell, which means like an open beaker. Either way, you have to control the temperature because you're following the progress of this titration by looking at the change in pH as you add more acid. And it's a somewhat cumbersome calculation to infer the alkalinity from that change in pH, but relatively straightforward. There are two variants. If you add the acid in just one lump, it can work. And you can also, with pH, either with a glass electrode or with a spectrophotometer. Glass electrode works quite well most of the time, and the rest of the time it doesn't. And the tricky part is knowing which was which. And that's probably the bane of alkalinity titrations in my own laboratory, is when we have a problem, nine times out of 10, the electrode caused that problem. How did we know we had a problem? Because we put in a sample of known alkalinity and we didn't measure the right number. How often do we do that? Once every 10. So we could have thrown away some result. If it just suddenly happened, you don't know when that problem necessarily started. We're trying to get around that by using an indicator die to look at the pH changes. But remember previous story. Indicator dyes bought commercially have impurities in them. So I have a student now who has satisfactorily shown to me that Yes, the indicator dye has impurities in it. We've done the chromatography to show that. Next, as yet not yet done, yes, we can purify it and then move on. So again, we'll let you know on that. So the estimated uncertainties for these measurements. So I'm just going to give you numbers here that are based, because we have the most experience of this, on measuring surface seawater. These numbers will change for measuring samples with high CO2 levels. I, I don't have that information with me today. Probably need to think about it more for a future publication. So in my lab, which I consider a state-of-the-art laboratory, we measure total carbon, pH, and alkalinity. We don't do PCO2 at the moment. We had done a little in the past, but the accuracy the uncertainty for total carbon is around 1, alkalinity about the same. For pH, our uncertainty is about 0.01. This number, it's hard to say, because that might be the uncertainty if everything else gets fixed. <laughs> As yet, it's not all got fixed. But these are really high quality measurements, remember? Money, no object. <laughs> bad, ma bad data matter. More typically at sea, things are about a factor of two worse. But again, that was money, no object. We just made the equipment a little bit more portable, and we couldn't weigh things because we're at sea. We have to measure, do everything volumetrically. Other techniques with reference materials probably fall, depending upon the technique, somewhere in these ranges. Somewhere between four, the uncertainty is between four and 10 times as large as the best you could get. With the exception of pH, which is probably only about twice as bad. <laughs> that assumes that you're using reference materials to make sure that your calibrations are working OK. If you don't, 
You haven't a clue how good the data are. You really don't. And if you don't know what the uncertainty is, you certainly don't know whether it's adequate for your scientific needs. So thinking about how you use reference materials to get the uncertainty is a key part of making these measurements. So overall, there are reference materials available for all of these. For PCO2, it's just gas phase reference materials. The costs kind of vary. The cheap and cheerful ones, alkalinity and pH, at less than 20,000 each. The others, total carbon, eh, about 60,000 probably. You can get a little cheaper than that probably, maybe 45 to 50, it depends. There's a lot of add-ons, you know, you say, oh, it's, I can buy the instrument, it's only $40,000. And you go, well, yes, but it's not gonna work if you don't also buy the computer and the thermostat bath and, and sooner or later another $10,000 gone. Sample sizes that are typical for these kind of qualities of uncertainties are quite large. And some of them, you've got a, three of them, you had to protect the samples from gas exchange. This was the benefit of alkalinity. CO2 going in or out didn't change the alkalinity. Don't have to worry about it. Just pour it into another container. The alkalinity stays the same. It's a real convenience. But sadly, there are interpretation difficulties. Alkalinity, the most likely way to mess up is not have good hydrochloric acid to titrate it. And our lab actually sells reference materials for total carbon and alkalinity. We sell calibration acid. We sell a pH reference material. So if, if we were only doing it well, we would be selling at a profit. Sadly, it's not at a profit. We, we sell it about a cost. So people get paid, but they don't feel rich. So this is my comments relevant to ocean acidification for these various methods at the moment. Infrared-based total carbon. It's quicker, therefore cheaper. Smaller sample size. Those are both good. It's a somewhat lower reproducibility. That may not matter too much for ocean acidification. At the moment, the real problem is not enough labs have compared how well they do this to say, and here is the method you should use. So you kind of have to go and watch somebody use it. And it's kind of like learning to bake by watching somebody and then walking away and trying it in your own kitchen. It can work, but it doesn't always. For pH, the ion selective FETs seem very promising. Colorimetry can be very stable. But FETs still needs work on calibration. Colorimetry still needs availability of pure dye. And until that's dealt with, there's a calibration uncertainty. PCO2, people always talk as though this is more relevant to ocean acidification. Because the picture in your mind is that opening picture I showed, the changing CO2 in the atmosphere, which is therefore modifying the ocean composition as CO2 dissolves in the ocean. But really, of course, your organism doesn't go, oh, 420 PS microatmospheres, can't stand it. They're, they're not th working that way. They really, perhaps, know the concentration of CO2, unionized CO2 in the water, or the concentration of carbonate, or whatever. So uh, I think it's a little bit sort of a rhetorical discussion as whether that's more relevant to ocean acidification. It's expensive. And you need to worry about the equilibration. It, it can be done. There are instruments that would work. Alkalinity, at the moment, we measure 100 mil samples. In principle, you can make measurements on smaller samples. We've done it. But at the moment, that ends up with a lower reproducibility. The electrode problems are what get you for alkalinity. When it works, it works really well. People in my lab, we can train somebody with the working equipment, we can train somebody within a day. And they can make measurements that are almost as good as the best people the next day, or not. And the real difference is the best people can tell the difference. <laughs> and somebody new can't. And that, that's really the awkward part still with that. And again, the problem, interpreting alkalinity. If there are other acid-based systems there, 
which seem to be present if you've got large amounts of phytoplankton in an enclosed regime, then it's harder to interpret. So what development state are we at? It's varied. If we imagine going from zero to five, it doesn't work. Somebody's got one. Other people have copied it. <laughs> We've all tried to make this sort of thing work after hearing about it. You can buy it. Not only can you buy it, they'll tell you how to use it. <laughs> Those are the different levels, right? You'd like level five. However, <laughs> with the possible exception of one of the PCO2 systems, <laughs> You're not at level five anywhere. <laughs> You're, you can buy systems. There are numerous ones in varying labs. In some cases, they're just things. Huh? These are sort of with you doing discrete sampling, continuous. This is for an oceanographic talk, so I was thinking about an observing system with those numbers. So the bad news is you can't just buy it on the whole and use it. My own recommendations, I'd probably go with an infrared-based analyzer for total carbon, and then I'd measure pH, either with this or this. There's advantages and problems to both. Alkalinity with an open cell titration. If you've got all three of those, you probably can characterize your seawater really well. As I said, what you'll find out is they don't perfectly agree with each other. There are some measurements I've seen where people think they are the PCO2 you calculate from alkalinity and total carbon could be 30% different from the PCO2 you calculate from total carbon and pH. That, to me, suggests that something's wrong. My own experience with high quality measurements is you can make that work within about 5%. <laughs> but perfect, never. PCO2, as I said, there is one membrane-based infrared system from a company called Contros that probably would work sensibly on an ocean acidification system. So we can use any two of these, remember? Two degrees of freedom to describe the CO2. Mathematically, all choices should be equivalent. That's not true. They're all experimental quantities. They all have uncertainties. The uncertainties propagate through the equations in different ways. Everything else is also a measured quantity the boron to seawater, salinity ratio, the pK1, the pK2. So those have uncertainty. So if you really think that the carbonate ion concentration is what matters to you, you don't know it that well because all these things also contribute to how well you don't know it. That doesn't quite make sense, but. So let's look at the differing possibilities. Differing pairs out of the four, six possibilities. So we're going to look at the relative uncertainty in the dissolved CO2 compared to the to total dissolved CO2 to the dissolved. So this can be expressed as a percentage or the carbonate ion. So with the best possible methods, we can estimate PCO2 to within 2.6% and carbonate to within about 3.6% for pH and alkalinity. With kind of average methods, it gets worse. <laughs> And this goes through for each one. For alkalinity and total carbon, which had real conveniences for measurement, the implied unionized CO2 can get quite large. But the carbonate ion always stays quite reasonable. Worst one is this pH and PCO2. Remember I said they could both be measured continuously. Wouldn't that be nice? Well, it would, but if carbonate ion is what you really wanted, <laughs> that measurement blows up in terms of its uncertainty. And the reason is the picture we saw at the end of the first talk. Changes in carbonate ion and pH and PCO2 are all almost parallel lines. So the degree to which you're doing it is you're trying to infer how non-parallel they are. They're highly correlated with each other, so the errors increase. So there's a wide variety of uncertainties. And so if you're saying, I need to get the carbonate uncertainty, then you've got to pick where you are, and you've got to pick 
your technique, which pair of parameters, your cost, how easy it is to use, the whole picture. Of course, this has far too many significant figures, just so you can see one column from another. Computer programs exist to do all these calculations, and you should get hold of one and get comfortable with using it, because it's the easiest way for yourself to just propagate errors through and say, well, oh, I measured an alkalinity of 2350, but it's probably only plus or minus 15. Fine, so what would the answer be if it was 2335? What would it be if it was 2365? How big the difference is that? Damn, too much. Go back and remeasure alkalinity. Great, move on, sort of simple decision possibilities. Typically, as I said, is two parameters. The one that I use is this one. And as I said, as you go through this throughout, this really is the essence. Think, there might be a better way. <laughs> Thank you. So should um, uncertainties from the machine and the operator be reported with the standard deviation of the variation of the CO2 system, or is that something that should be reported separately? Well, the uncertainties of the machine and the operator is something you should try to become aware of, and the easiest way, those two appear automatically in a standard deviation. The things that don't appear in a standard deviation is how well calibrated it was. The other thing that may not appear is whether or not there's some blank that was adequately corrected for. And so the hard part in getting a complete uncertainty is thinking of all these possibilities. But the two you mentioned really just appear automatically in any precision number you get. If the operator can't do the same thing twice, this appears as a larger precision number a larger standard deviation. My opinion, when you report a number, you should say what you believe its uncertainty to be. And depending on the kind of audience you're reporting it for, you should then say why you believe it to be that uncertainty. And there are papers where that's the complete focus. Let's say we want to measure what, what is the Faraday constant. Most of the focus will be on understanding the uncertainty of that. If you're simply talking about the behavior of an organism in changing conditions, then this is a much smaller part. But to state a number without any recognition that it has an uncertainty associated with it would, I think, be problematic. <laughs>